My name is Sarah Levis. I work for a company called GK Technology. We are a software company that um, we provide a mapping software for our customers to use. We also provide mapping services. Um, and, and we've been around in the, in, the, in the countryside for a number of years. Our, our original computer programmer, Gary Johnson, actually started writing software about 25 years ago. He's a self-taught computer coder, um, and he worked in the agronomy industry prior to that. Um, I have a background in, uh, in agronomy for a number of years. I've worked for aid retail, I've worked for distribution, I've worked for basic manufacturers, and I was an independent crop consultant. Um, but here I am doing this job now, and it's a lot of fun. So precision soil sampling. Who grids? Who zones? And who cares? This is a picture of our company right now. Um, this picture, ooh, wow, goodness gracious. Okay, that's how that works. There we go. This picture is currently out of date because we're missing two employees out of here. We have two um, employees that have joined. And um, in July, we had a gentleman by the name of Eric Lee join. He is not an agronomist and he's not a computer programmer. He is somebody that actually manages our servers. If you've ever worked with our software before, there's part of our package where you can actually um, buy access to our servers. We have a satellite imagery library in there that goes back to 1984 for most of the United States, um, a good portion of Canada, um, as well as the most current LiDAR data that's available as well. That's all free data, but what we have invested into it is man hours um, processing it so that it's easily usable in our software package. The other individual actually just started yesterday working for GK Technology. Her name is Jody Bo. She is an agronomist and she's going to be doing sales and support similar to me. If you call me, I'm, a, I'm an agronomist. My background is more focused in soils. My master's degree is in soils. Um, I will help you learn how to run the software or I can help you with mapping or I can help you think through about the agronomic things that you're trying to accomplish with precision agriculture. I do want to point out that the owners of the company are Darren Johnson and Kelly Sharp. They are a couple of gentlemen that hail from Northwest Minnesota from Halston and Shelley. This is a homegrown company and it still remains a small company. We're very proud of that. Anyway, let's get to the nuts and bolts of what we really want to talk about here. So fertilizer, this is uh, fertilizer prices going into um, the end of July of 2022. And you can see at that time, the fertilizer prices just got absolutely nuts. You remember that in 2022, right? But let's fast forward to end of July of 2023. And I should update these again now that we've got some end of December, since there's a lot of probably pre-buying considerations going on. But nonetheless, you can see that they went up, they went down, they're kind of stagnant, they're still high. They're volatile. I heard some definite volatility and supply issues. Anyway, fertilizer is volatile. So this means that just like acid washed high waste jeans from the 1980s and how they're back in style, soil sampling is cool again. Okay, I'm here just for the next hour. So don't worry, you don't have to listen to me for too long. Um, but there's a lot of different kinds of soil sampling that exists. Um, there's grid sampling, there's composite sampling, and there's zone sampling. So where do each one of these things fit? How can we use precision agriculture in each one of these methods? First of all, this is data from, um, from AgVice Laboratories that shows that the amount of grid and zone samples over the years have definitely increased over time. Um, they're, they are definitely seeing more precision soil samples going through, and this is the Northwood lab. And this is an important thing to consider. So we are doing more precision soil sampling. But let's talk about what each one of those soil sampling methods are and how we could use um, soil sampling as part of them and where they might fit best into our agronomic practice. So what is a composite soil sample? A composite soil sample is where you go out and in about a quarter section, you pull 20 cores, you put them all in a bucket, you mix them all up and you send them into the lab and you get back your analysis. You are attempting to get back 
an average value for that field, okay? With that in mind, you want to pull your cores from average places in the field, right? You don't want to pull those soil samples from the bottom of a ditch or right behind a yard that might have been a, a cattle yard at one time. You want to find the average value for that field. In North Dakota, Northern Minnesota, we are generally, when we soil sample, pulling a zero to six and a six to 24 inch sample. That, that two foot sample tends to be pretty standard. There have been some places where people have moved away from that. We're gonna talk about why we sample the different depths here in a minute. Okay, so hang on to that thought. But it's pretty quick and easy. And one thing that you can certainly do is you can mark your GPS points um, for where you sample, and then you can go back and soil sample those points every year. Let me ask a question in this room. How many people in here actually pull soil samples in the fall of the year? And, and around And the person who is actually pulling the soil samples makes a really important difference because you actually have to have somebody in that pickup in that soil sample rig that cares about the, the quality of the course. So you're doing the Lord's work. Okay. Um, anyway, but one thing that you can consider with precision agriculture and composite sampling, there is actually a fit there. So go in, mark the points that you where you're pulling those points and mark them year after year. What I noticed when I did that is the first time I would go in and plan out where I was gonna put those points, it would take me a little bit longer the first time I was doing that. But then the years consecutively, it would actually save me a lot of time oh, yeah. because I knew exactly where the, in the field I wanted to go and drive. And it made soil sampling that faster. The other thing is, you know, if you end up soil sampling in November, the day late gets a little short, right? And so if you've got a computer screen and you can see a map of the field and where you're actually driving, it can help you make good decisions if it tends to get a little bit dark at night to know where you want to be um, soil sampling. It, it sounds pretty simple, but it, it actually does make a pretty big difference. Okay, so you pull the average of the field and you're getting average results. This is what a typical soil sample report looks like. Okay, these are just fertilizer recommendations or nutrient recommendations over here, but these are your sample results. And it's hard to see we're dealing with a smaller screen in here, but if there's something we really need to get pointed out, I'll, I'll make sure you guys hear it. Okay, so what are the pros and the cons of composite soil sampling? The pros, it's relatively inexpensive. Really, this is the quickest, fastest, cheapest method of soil sampling for a field right here. Um, it works really well for two foot sampling. Um, the cons, if you've got a lot of field variability, you might be overlooking um, some very important soil sample results that you're not gonna find with an average value. So this just does not work well for, uh, for a field that's got a lot of field variability. Um, all right, and let's talk about stability. So when you're pulling average results, one of the things that I, when you're when you're marking your soil sample points and you come back year after year, one of the things that I like to do is see if I'm actually working with a quote unquote average field, or I'm getting stable results year after year. There are some soil parameters out there that are not mobile nutrients, and we're going to talk about soil mobile and non mobile nutrients a little bit later in this presentation. Okay. But you can check your non-mobile nutrients and kind of get an idea if you should move beyond composite sampling and into zones or grids. Okay. The way you do that is you mark your sample points, you soil sample them every year in the same spot. And if you're getting weird results that vary quite a bit, especially on your phosphorus or your potassium, that can be an indication that you might need to be um, um, moving on to doing zones or grids. So this is an example of a field that I pulled years ago and you can't see these results, but the, in 2014, I pulled a 19 Olsen phosphorus, 19 parts per million. And I thought, man, that just seems really high for what I know about this field. That was about the time that I started 
marking my composite soil samples. Okay, so I did a retake on that and I got a 2014 and I stayed further away from this yard. I didn't sample this point anymore. Uh, it's gonna be tough to see, but I stayed away from this yard. Uh, and then my, my phosphorus levels dropped down to 14 parts per million. The following 2015, when I went back and I sampled in the same spots, I got a, a, a 13 parts per million, which made a lot more sense. <laughs> Prior to, to marking these points and keeping track of this, this would bounce all over the place on that phosphorus. And if I could recommend this, this, this happens to be a Fargo clay field. So it's a piece of I-29, one soil type. There is a lot of micro topography in here. You can see where the hills and the, the valleys and how it all drains skis. And then you've got this farmyard. I would actually zone this out. And I think there would be a very big benefit to this farm. Even if it only got down to the point where we ended up doing two zones out there, just behind that farmyard and the rest of the field. But I think we would find some big variability out there. But that can be a big indication of whether you need to start looking at zones or not. So what is variability then? When we're talking about checking that phosphorus and potassium, what exactly is variability? You know, when I, when I took those soil samples from 14 and 15, one year it was 14 parts per million, the next year it was 13 parts per million. Is that variability? Or are we getting pretty close to the same results? Pretty close to the same results, okay? So when you get, when you send your lab, when you send your soil samples into the lab, it is possible to get about one to two part per million uh, on an Olsen phosphorus, under 10 parts per million. It's possible to get that kind of variability coming from the lab, okay? They run their check soils. A certified lab is gonna run a check soil about every three or four soils. Um, and there's gonna be three of them and they're gonna be very different soils that get run through as their check soils. And those check soils have to land in spec, okay? But within that, if you're getting sample results back on the same field that are within one to two parts per million, less than 10, on a less than 10 parts per million test, you're right on the money. Hey, you're getting exactly the same result, pretty much. If you're up, if you're between, if it's varying about two parts per million uh, and 11 to 40 parts per million, you're, you're landing right in the pickle barrel, okay? But you can get sampling error from other places. And again, at the beginning of the, the presentation, I asked, are you the guy actually running the, the soil sample, or yeah, running the soil sample array? Because if you are, that's a really important job. The quality of that soil sample that's getting pulled is critical. Um, are you pulling, when you divide your cores up, 0 to 6, 6 to 24, are you actually putting a 6-inch core in that 6-inch bucket? If you're not, and consistently with that, that phosphorus and that potassium number will be off. So whoever is pulling that soil sample is critical. Um, and then how many cores per field are you actually pulling? The minimum in any field should be 50 cores and between 20 to 30 cores should be best. And then of course, sampling location. If, when you're doing composite sampling, again, you're trying to achieve an average. So you need to make sure that you're pulling from average places. Do not pull near the, um, the field approach. Don't pull on the headland. Don't pull near a farmyard where there may be cattle or livestock in the, or ditches or water ponds. You wanna stay away from those places. How many soil cores um, to have an accurate result? This is really important, not only for this conversation, but going forward, especially in the grid sampling when we get to that point. Uh, Kansas State did a study, and you can see that um, the, the confidence really increases as the number of soil or the, the level of error really decreases as you increase the number of the cores that are taken. So composite sample, this study found that this, the composite sample should have at least 15 cores and between 20 to 30 cores is best. And in small area sampling like grid, you should have at least 12 to 15 cores. If you're grid sampling again, I'll say that again, you should have between 12 to 15 cores. And that's really important because most grid samplers are still probably only pulling 10. Speaking of grid sampling, what is grid sampling? Let's talk about that. 
In grid sampling, what we do is we take a field. Oh, when you work for a mapping company, if you don't have um, your maps, that's going to get really interesting. Oh, I did, didn't I? That's interesting. Okay, there it is. Okay. All right. The clicker is kind of scary. Okay. Um, all right. So what you do is you take your field, you divide it into a grid, and your grids are going to be a certain size. Okay, so two and a half acre grids tends to be very common. That's what most grid samplers are doing. However, scientific research has shown that that might actually be too large to actually describe the field variability. Uh, I think if you were to talk to Dave Franzen, he would actually recommend getting down to about one acre grids. I want you to think about some of the field sizes that we have in North Dakota, especially as you go west. Imagine soil sampling one acre grids. It's pretty intense. But yes, I have actual soil sampled a half section on two and a half acre grids. And it was a lot. Okay. So, um, but common practice right now is most of the time two and a half acre grids, approximately 10 cores per grid. Okay, again, we just saw the slide previously where it said you should be pulling 12 to 15 cores. And Dave Franz and instead one acre grids is best. Okay. You can do grid sampling down to two depths, 0 to 6, 6 to 24. Usually, most of the time, we're only pulling the top six inches because we're trying to describe the non mobile nutrients more than the mobile nutrients. Again, yeah, we're going to talk about non mobile and mobile nutrients in a minute. Um, there has been some grid sampling done in our area but it really has come out of the Corn Belt states. That's where it really got started. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between Corn Belt states and, and some of more of the wheat states and how precision agriculture adoption has been built a little bit different in those two places in a second. Okay, this is what grid sampling data looks like. A little bit different than, uh, than soil sampling. Each one of these lines is one of those grids. <laughs> So what you do is you take those grid sampling results, you put them in the computer with your grid, you process it out, and it makes a map. Okay. So each one of these was derived from that, that spreadsheet that you just saw. And they look different. This is the Olson phosphorus map, this is the potassium map, and this is the pH map. They look very different. And that's why grid sampling is handy. Because if you have a different geographical distribution of some of some of those, especially non-mobile nutrients, you can really describe that quite well. But here's the, one of the big take-home messages for this presentation. The soil sampling itself explains the variability of the soil. I'm going to say that again. Grid sampling. It's the soil sampling itself that explains the variability of the soil and what's going on. Okay. So with zone sampling, in zone sampling, what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of data. We're going to put a bunch of data layers together, and we're going to have the data describe the variability in the field. And we're going to statistically separate out areas of the field that are similar and different from each other and consider it as each zone as if it's its own field. So in here, I took a bunch of data, put it all together, came up with five zones. Dark green, light green, yellow, orange, and red. In this instance, the red is going to be the, the least producing area, and the greatest production is going to come from the dark green. Okay? So then what happens is each one of those colors gets soil sampled separately as if it's its own field. And we consider them as its own, its own field, and then we'll just make prescriptions from there. We'll interpolate, and, and the spreader will still drive across at once. So in zone sampling, this is the second important thing for this presentation. In zone sampling, the data describes the variability. In grid sampling, it was the soil sampling that describes this, the variability. With zones, it's data. That's all those things are different. So any, um, each zone is going to probably get someplace between 10 to 20 cores pulled, depending upon how big the zone is and how many acres are in the zone. Sampling depth can be very common, one to two depths 
this works quite well for larger fields because obviously, you know, where we were talking about doing two and a half acre grids before, this I've had zones that are 80 acres. So how do you decide where your zones are if you've never done it? You know, the, 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 the things are easy. The, the low area is the road to hilltops. But how do you I mean that's not a straight line map by any means? So, how do you, if you're originally going out there, you just got feeling or <laughs> any tips? Of no, well, I mean, that's it's how you put the data together. Yes. So, the way that I do it is I, I can use um, any, it's, it's up to who's making the zones. Okay. Right. And so you can have barracks and salinity data, you can have topography data, you can have satellite yep. imagery, you can have yield data. And literally I turn all those, whatever layers I have on my screen and I just start, I've got computer strips and I just start putting these data layers together. And then I run the stats on it and it automatically splits out based on different statistical models, how that works. And because of my agronomy background and my soils background, I literally take a look at the zones and put it over the top of the topography. And if it looks right, and I put it in front of the farmer, and the farmer says it looks right, then you got something. Well, the farmer himself, he's been over that field. Um, who's, who in here is farming? Okay, ma'am, can you tell me? Feel that you're farming. How many years have you been over your, your most frequently farmed field? How many it's soils? It's farming. It's farming. Combine. <laughs> yeah. So what? Ten years? Twenty years? Okay. And I don't want to bring up your age, but okay. Sir, so can I ask you? You farm, right? How many, how many years have you been over your most? Thirty-five. Thirty-five years. These two individuals, they know where the high and the low yielding parts to field are. They know that. So if you make those zones and you put it in front of the farmer and you say, excuse me, Madam Farmer, Sir Farmer, does this look like your field? And they say yes. You got yourself a good zone. If they kind of go, well, maybe, better go back and take another look. And by the way, farmers are usually pretty nice about how they come back to you with your market. So if they say, oh, I don't know, kind of, sort of, you better go back. I was just going to say, like last year when we got our map shot, our ground is um, yeah. out from one of the buses. Yeah. We didn't have them labeled so well, but we could tell exactly what they were just by just by looking, like a quick look. They were right, and they made sense. Yeah, exactly. So when you are working with a precision agriculture agronomist, that is something, or somebody who's making maps, that is something that is critically important. Yes. yes. You you shown in some of your maps that. Different colors due to potassium, phosphorus, uh, pH, and those. So when you get a zone, how do you know that the poor yielding part is due to a low phosphorus, or it could be a low or extreme pH, or something else? How do you, how do you know that within a zone when it varies all over the place? Well, that's okay. So technically, the zones should be creating a good description of the variability across the field based on the data. The challenge is, is that when you soil sample, this is how it's going to be set up, and it doesn't matter whether it's phosphorus, potassium, or um, phosphorus, potassium, or pH. Now, I want to point something out. This is the same field that you just saw on this previous slide. Okay, but we're going to talk about why a soil sample this in a second as a grid. Because this is a very interesting field, and you're leading up to that right now. So, no, so just no. wait, there's more. <laughs> so anyway, let's keep talking, and we're going to get there. But if I don't answer your question, make sure we get there, okay? All right, but I think it's in here. Okay, so this is what your soil sampling data looks like for zones. Way less. I happen to call the dark and the light green as one zone, because to me, as an agronomist who worked with this field for many years, I felt like it made a lot of sense to, to pull those two colors together, which I, I do that frequently. So I soil sample, my greens is one zone, my yellows is a zone, orange and, and um, red. I want to point a couple of things out here. The potassium in here on the greens, 17 parts per million, yellow four, 
Orange is seven parts per million and red is 11. The potassium is very interesting. 250 parts per million in the greens, 145 in the yellow, 112 on the orange and 86 in the red. And by the way, I started zoning this out in 2009 and I think the first one that I pulled on the reds was 66 parts per million. No wonder the corn did so crappy there. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so hold on to those numbers for a second because we're gonna come back and talk about the phosphorus and the potassium in particular, okay? But first, let's just talk about comparing grids and zones, okay? Grids takes approximately 10 cores per grid, 2.5 acres per grid. And I'm gonna talk about standard soil sampling methods that people are using right now. In zones, it's approximately 15 to 20 cores per zone, three to seven zones per field is about average for what I'm working with. So you can tell that there's a big difference in the volume of cores that you have to take. Um, grids, it can be any depth, but the most prominent, uh, most common is zero to six inch in this geography. Zones, it can be any depth, but the most common is zero to six and six to 24. I will also say that I've done quite a bit of four foot sampling with zones in sugar beet country. Grids, it is the most expensive and the most labor intensive soil sampling method available. Grids, it's more expensive and labor intensive than composite sampling, but less than grids. Grids, if, if the grids are too large or you're not pulling enough cores, you're not gonna describe the field variability well. That's really important with grids. Zones, if the zones are not created well and you don't put that data together well, you're gonna have bad zones and nothing is gonna work well. That mentioned that her, her zone maps look great on the money. I've, I've worked with people that have also shut off the prescriptions in their tractors because of a lack of confidence in the prescription to the rates being in the wrong place. The only reason why we would have rates in the wrong place is if the zones are set up wrong. So this is a half section, two and a half acre grids. I pulled this myself, six inch samples. It took a long time, 112 grids. This is the zones that I had set up. This is a field I know very well. This is a, a, a ridge in the middle, um, it's sandy. Um, this is a salty headland where nothing grows, which is why I got modded out. And these dark green areas are Fargo clay, okay? The soil pH varies from like, 7.8 to like five, it's amazing. So this is just the cost and the labor for this field difference between everything, okay? With approximate. So grids would cost approximately $3,700 total in labor and analysis fees. And by the way, you would need to pull about over 1,100 cores in that field on a grid. For zones, you'd be pulling about 90 cores total um, and total cost would be about 432 bucks and composite, um, you know, you'd be doing a total of 30 cores out here and a total cost of 130 bucks. So definitely differences in cost, labor intensity and everything else. Can you run? Me and you went to a twin out of grid. This ain't every year, this will be three or five. It takes some time to pay. It takes a lot of time. It took me a good, it took me a bed half a day to see that one. Oh, I'm talking years ago. Yeah, the, the, la the labor wise to actually pull the samples, it took me half a day to do that. And I had a wind text pulling, you know, it's a very fast way of soil sampling. But um, but you're right. Well, you would, I would not recommend doing it every year. You know, three and so Oh, being at most three. It's because if you've got a, a background in a lot of, um, a lot of manure. You know, you can probably even do it five to ten years if you get the right to leave the base on. Maybe it depends. Do you think yours older describing your field variability well? Because oh, I got twelve. Twelve years of done good. Now it's something that's going back the other way. Okay. Well then maybe you should look at grips. But it's one of those things you get a baseline and then you can we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And it and that conversation is gonna start right here, because we're gonna talk about the Corn Belt states and North Dakota, and why are they different, okay? 
first of all, precision agriculture was adopted way faster in Corn Belt states than it was in the wheat states. That's just how it was. Okay. And so grid sampling was one of the more one of the first ways of doing um, precision agriculture to manage nutrient management. Okay. So the soil sampling is different between both of these areas. Grid sampling is way more prominent in the Corn Belt states than it is here in North Dakota. The soil sampling depth is different. In the Corn Belt states, they assume that all of the nitrogen is gone. Okay, they don't really have this thing called winter. And they don't really have this thing called drought. Like, okay, nitrogen can, needs water to move through the soil. When the soil is frozen, nothing moves through the soil. When it's dry, nothing moves through the soil. And yeah, I know they talk about their droughts that are going to ruin their 300 bushel corn and they can get 295 and everything else. But I mean, it's, I'm sorry if anybody's here. Okay, so planters versus air seeders. There's way more planters out in the Corn Belt states than there are here in North Dakota. We have a lot of air seeders. It's not a big deal. I write a ton of prescriptions to air seeders. It's just a different way of doing it and a different way of thinking about things. Um, the adoption rates of precision agriculture were way greater and quicker in the Corn Belt states compared to the areas dominated by wheat. The field size and the acreages are a lot different. So an Indiana farm averages 269 acres versus the average North Dakota farm size is 1,500 acres. Um, and those are NAS data. I realize that we can talk about everybody who's bigger and smaller and everything else in North Dakota. Um, and the land values are different, okay? So, and this is 2021 land value data. Okay, we can talk about you know, $14,000 in acre corn sales up in the Northeast corner of the state, all we want. But in 2021, the average um, corn belt crop land value was about $6,900 an acre. And in the Northern states, it was about $3,000 an acre. So if you're gonna spend all that money on grid sampling, it's a lot easier to do that with land that's valued at $6,900 an acre. You're probably gonna be getting 300 bushels of corn. Braver, right? Versus us being in our more unpredictable situation. As okay, so why soil sample two depths? We're going to talk about that now. And this is soil mobile versus non mobile nutrients. Soil mobile nutrients are nutrients that will move with the water in the soil. Okay, so they can move, whereas non mobile nutrients will either adhere to um, the soil. Or, or by the cation sheet capacity. They're not going to move as readily with water. So when it rains, um, for example, nitrogen will move deeper into the soil profile. And it can eventually like leach out of the system if you've got sand enough soil to allow for that. Okay. Um, P and K are definitely your non-mobile nutrients. The more your non-mobile nutrients. Although if you get into a sandy area, if you get into a field that doesn't have a lot of and I change capacity, you can see your potassium from somewhat. That's another conversation for another day. We probably should have ventured there. Yeah. Anyway, it, consider it a non mobile nutrient. So, when you're doing a zero to six inch sample, this is what you're really analyzing for all of these things, whether they're mobile or not mobile. But in a six to 24 inch sample, you're getting more of your mobile nutrients, you know, your chlorides, your sulfates, your nitrogen, pH, because you pH isn't mobile, but you need to know what pH is down below, and your salts, because you need to know how that nitrogen is moving. In drought years, we need to see how much nitrogen is in that zero to 24 profile. And in sugar beets, I'm definitely pulling down to four feet because that deep nitrogen will affect the quality of those beets. And we can definitely have residual nitrogen here. That's a big deal. So as I said earlier, nitrogen doesn't move in frozen soils and it doesn't move in drought soils. And you can pick this out. This is um, Egg Vice Laboratories residual nitrogen following the wheat. You can pick out every drought you're on here. So drought of 2021, average um, for the Egg Vice Laboratories was 66 
pounds of nitrogen left over? How many people had fields with north of 100 pounds of nitrogen left in their fields that year? There's a lot of them. A lot of them. Because it was dry and it didn't leave the system. But you can pick out 1988. You can pick out 2012. So that's why having a two light sample in North Dakota is so critical. In the Corn Belt states, they have such a high moisture regime that they assume that the nitrogen is reaching out. I don't know if that's a fair assumption or not. I don't necessarily agree with that, but this is my culture right here too, to take that for what it's worth. But this is why this is critical for North Dakota. So where do grids fit in? Grids fit in where, especially as you move the fields that are bigger in North Dakota, I'm always going to recommend for people to start in either a composite or a zone sample. Okay, a composite sample fits really well. Most places in the east side of the, the valley, east of I-29, where it's flat, one soil type. I do recommend that everybody um, is marking their GPS points to figure out um, how consistent their soil samples are from the year. After that, if you've got a lot of changes in your field and you just know that you've got yield changes out there, then I recommend zones. If you have reason to believe that those zones are not predicting where that field variability is existing, then it's time to take the next step and go to grids and really start thinking about something different. Okay, if your zones aren't predicting your field variability, you well, either need new zones or you need to start trying to figure out what to do with grids. Um, grids will also predict man-made occurrences way better than zones will. So if you've got a lot of manure spreading out there with that man-made manure spreader, pick up on where that's happening, I recommend grids. And not every year. A lot of times when you get that baseline for those non-mobile nutrients, you can use that in the future to help you kind of figure out where things are. If you're doing manure probably once every, um, you know, three to five years, if you're doing, um, if, if you don't have manure in your system, I think you could actually almost get away with every 10 years. It's a pretty bold statement, but I'd be willing to try it. So that field that I showed you, this is the, the zone field right here that I showed you earlier. That when I started zoning it in 2009, it had 66 parts per million of yeah. potassium in this part of the field. Okay. And I knew that this map, after I got that back and I looked at those sample results, I knew that that potassium was really the most limiting factor out there. And I knew that this zone map was highly based on the potassium value. But what would happen is I would I would zone sample this and my phosphorus numbers would bounce all over the place. I can remember one year in the green zones getting six parts per minute, then 14 parts per minute, then 20 parts per minute. It was really weird. I was getting really weird phosphorus results coming back up every time. And I couldn't figure out why. So I gridded it. So this is the potassium map. That potassium map, if you look, geographic distribution of that looks pretty similar to the zone map, right? But look at this Olson phosphorus map. There's something here, and I think it has to do with the fact that there was a schoolhouse in here. So I think this was like the road to the schoolhouse or something like that. Um, but this is a really big hotbed. Some like that purple spot, that's like north of 40 parts per million on the Olson phosphorus. So once I graded it out, I was able to find that. But look at where the green zones are. So if I went across that green, one of those hot spots and I was sampling the green zone, that's why I was getting all those really weird phosphorus numbers. So since then, this field was managed with this geographic distribution in line for the phosphorus. Um, the phosphorus numbers actually down here got as low as like four parts per million. So pretty low in some spots. So it really did need to have this done. Um, this is another really interesting one. If, if you are having, if you know maybe you've got some limiting yield issues out there, and you kind of want to know or understand just a little bit more 
Good sample if you know it with that as well. Um, this field right here, um, that's that half section. Again, I told you a little bit about it. It's got that sandy part through it. That it was always kind of weird because this was sort of like the best part of the field, but not really, especially in a wet year because you know this is all Fargo played, kind of run off and pounded and stuff would drown out. There's no drain tile in this field. But what I found when I soil sampled it is the soil pH in that red zone actually gets down to about 5.4. 5.4. Now this is two miles, three miles west of I-29, south of Hillsborough. Last place on the face of the planet where we would ever think about seeing some of pH that low. But we're also very close to sugar beet factory, which means we've got access to the line there if we want to try to remediate it. And actually, a variable rate line has been so one of the biggest precision agriculture sellers in the Corn Belt states. So there's a lot of really good fits for this concept. It really helped open up um, my mind about how to ask questions about this field and made me think about this field a little bit differently. Now, there is no manure history on either this field or the field that I showed you before. So I don't know when the next spring would ever be that this, these would get graded, um, but at least now we understand it a little bit better. Okay, and I cannot plug this enough. The zone creation is absolutely critical. You have to have good zones. You put those zones in front of a farmer and they don't think they look like a field, you gotta go back to the drawing board. Okay, so let's talk about changes in soil sampling practices and how soil sampling is changing. There's a, um, there's a, a survey that comes out from Crop Life America and Purdue University every year. And this was from 2021. It's a dealership survey. So farmers aren't actually um, polled in this survey, but what the people that are polled are, are the, the actual dealers, the people offering the service. And so what's interesting is, um, though this is, the gray bars are 2020, 2015, 2017 is the blue bars, 2019 is um, this kind of um, reddish color, and then 2021 is the brown color. And what's interesting is when you take a look, okay, the respondents for this, because this is from Purdue, most of them are from the Corn Belt. Okay, there's like just a couple respondents from, from our Corn Belt. So by and far and away, this is really reflective of what's going on in the, in the Corn Belt states, which is one of the things that makes it so interesting. The grid sampling has dropped from 2015, where it was 75% of what was being done, down to 56% in 2021. And what's interesting about that is, you would think that maybe you would move to zones and have zones increase, no, zones are hanging right around 50% and have been for years. But when you take a look at the, the composite sampling, that's gaining. It's up to like almost 70% of what they're offering. Them. Why is that? I think maybe, maybe not. Well, out there, they've got a lot more manure than what we have. And, and so gridding would be more commonplace. Remember their field sizes are going to be a lot. So they're not going to be in more grid sampling has Let's talk a little bit about precision agriculture. Embodied knowledge technologies. Those are things like your autos here. Those are things like your section model, right? You get into your tractor cab, you push the button, the tractor drives itself. We all love it. We don't have to think about it anymore until it goes out and the high demand calls you on the radio and says, my auto steer went out. What do I do? And you come back and you say, grab the wheel. It's going to be okay. <laughs> right? Okay. But we don't have to think about that. Whereas information sensitive technologies are one where you actually have to think about the information and how you're putting the information together. Things like zones and making prescriptions. You actually have to think about how you're putting those data layers together to make those zones. We actually have to think about the rates that you're putting into the prescription. You actually have to think about how you're sending that prescription out to the controller so the controller can interpret it, right? It's all kinds of things. Now, I'm gonna read this to you. This is the worst word slide ever, absolutely boring, but it's critically important. This is from the 2020 Agriculture Dealership Survey. 
Um, and it's just very interesting. Auto steer versus near teeth. Auto guidance and auto controls on inputs are known mostly standard equi equipment across dealerships, partially because they are relatively simple to use and the benefits are relatively obvious. Get in, you don't have to drive. Right? Okay. Guidance and section controllers don't depend on site specific information to extract value. Only locations in previous applications. They help reduce costs by reducing skips, overlaps, and dupli duplicate applications. In contrast, the information intensive side of precision farming continues to link in demonstrating value. Using site specific information from fields such as remote sensing imagery, soil test results, soil or yield maps to characterize and understand field variability and its impact on crop performance and then to act upon that variably managing fields has been a greater challenge than many would have predicted decades ago. In other words, we need more people in the industry who know how to work with data, who can understand agronomy and how and why we put it together. We are lacking the people who know how to put together data in the labor book. My recommendation to you, if you're a farmer, make sure when you're working with a precision agriculture agronomist that you're working with someone who understands agronomy and understands how to work with you. I work on two that right now. So when you are going to work with precision agriculture, you need to know three things. You need to understand agronomy or livestock production. I'm not going to talk about livestock because my contribution to the, uh, the livestock industry is eating steak. Unless it's a vacant wrap steak, I don't understand. But I appreciate those who do it a lot. So you need to have that agronomy knowledge. You need to understand equipment engineering. You need to know how the equipment works. And you need to understand how software works. When you know those three things, that's where you have a really good precision agriculture program. Now you can have these things overlapping and have really good things that come out of these. Like for example, if, if you've got a place where, where software and equipment engineering overlap, you can have auto steering section control. We love those things. They're great. And they are. They, they do wonderful things. If you understand equipment engineering and agronomy, you can you have the ability to variable rate. I know lots of people that'll turn on variable rate of iron and DHA fertilizer. They'll just turn it on and shut it off in their chat. That's variable rating. Okay, right? On and off. You can, uh, if you understand software um, and agronomy, you can make beautiful zones and beautiful prescriptions. But if you don't have all three of these things, you're going to be lacking some stuff sometimes. For example, if you don't understand anything about agronomy, but you understand software and equipment engineering, you can have zones and prescriptions that don't make any sense at all. I have seen that a million times over. Look, we're variable rating. What is the point of variable rating if that rate is the right rate for the right place? If you don't understand agronomy, you're not going to get it. Um, if you understand equipment engineering and, and agronomy, but you don't understand how computers work, you can do things like non-calibrated yield data. That's my favorite example for that one. Because you can come to me with your yield data, and if it hasn't been somewhat calibrated a little bit, there are things that I might not be able to fix. It's a okay, failure to my decision maker tells me about it. They'll fix it. But I'll tell you this. There comes a point in time when I uh, charge by the hour for that stuff, and I make a good dime doing it, and I'm probably still not going to get good yield data for some things you just can't fix. And if you understand agronomy and software, you can make the most beautiful zones and prescriptions, but if you don't understand how the equipment works, you might not be able to get that prescription into the equipment and get it to work. Then you're sitting on the end of a field with a tractor, rain is coming, and you can't apply the fertilizer because you can't get towards the control. So you need to have all three of these things. The good news is, is there's a lot of people in the industry today who are all three of these. It's a new world, but they're out there. I even know some of them that are sitting in this room right now. That's very fun. So make sure for your farming operation that you get to work with one of those people. So in some summary, composite grids and zones, they all have their place. Okay. Um, if you've got fairly flat, predictive ground, go for the average soil test result, use a composite. If you need to understand variability more, start with the zone. If you're not getting all of your, your questions answered, move to the grid. Consider that. 
Um, if you've got a lot of man-made things happening in that field, the grid might work for you best. Um, do geo-reference your sample points on composites and use them year to year. Always put together good zones. And if you need to understand the field better, try grid sampling. The only wrong answer is not the source. 